Hey everybody, Voltar here, and today we are going to be installing Tim Worthington's NES RGB kit into this AV Famicom. Now the NES RGB is a fantastic modification that will give you RGB output as well as encoded video formats such as uh, composite video, S-video, and even component video if you buy the extra module. Now, you know, this is going to be a bare bones install today, uh, and I'm going to be focusing a lot of time on what a lot of people consider the crux of this mod, which is removing the PPU's dual inline package. Um, you know, often people really screw that part up, and they often really damage their uh, NES and Famicom mainboards, so we're going to be spending some time there. Uh, but at any rate, sit back, strap on, and let's do what Nintendo. Okay, as always, we'll begin by flipping this old girl around and breaking things down. Okay, the case is off, the board's removed, now we're going to begin by working the PPU off of the board. Now this is the first step that I like to do. I mean, you can do this any, in any order that you want to. This is just how I do it. Um, I want to spend some time on this. So let's, let's flip this board around, let's zoom in, and let's talk about some things that may help you in removing this safely without damaging the chip or the main board. Let's do it. Okay, so we've zoomed in here quite a bit, and we're looking at two chips. Uh, you see this long dip package and this long dip package. Well, the one on the top here, the AV Famicom, this is the CPU. Uh, this is the 2803. With the NES RGB, we don't do anything with it unless we're doing sound. And most importantly, we're not removing this one. Now, the one that we are removing is this bottom chip, which is the 2CO2, and this is the PPU. So let's flip this around, and let's just take a look. And here's what we have. We have you know, the, the outline for the CPU, and we have the footprint outline for the PPU. Now, there are a variety of different ways you can remove this. And let me just say that if you are a beginner, which you probably are if you're watching this, and you're wanting to do this install yourself, do not use a mechanical pump and try to avoid using a bulb um, desoldering uh, tool. You want a vacuumized uh, electronic apparatus um, you can use a Heiko 808, you can use any Heiko tool, but you know what I use these days um, is are, are really cheap uh, <laughs> Heiko clones. I have a Z uh, ZD915 uh, that will make short work of this and do an excellent job. I'll go over that tool uh, in a little more detail uh, in a future video, but for now just know uh, you don't have to have expensive tools uh, to do this kind of work. You can spend about $90 on a Heiko clone, uh, on on you know something that's comparable uh, and that's efficient enough to do this and last a long time. So, point one: avoid uh, solder puts, avoid uh, any uh, mechanical tool if you can. Now, a couple of other things here to talk about. Before we get into removing this solder, we need to understand what we're doing. We are working with a two-layer mainboard that's, I guess, maybe 1.8 uh, millimeters in thickness. And there are a lot of ground pores in this board. So when you apply heat and you're putting energy into these through-hole vias, there's a lot of thermal reliefs and there's a lot of other things in the area that are just going to basically soak that heat away and not let you wet these joints very thoroughly. So there's something that you can do for that, and that's introducing fresh tin or fresh solder to all of these joints. Now it's going to do two things. One, it's going to dilute the chemistry a little bit so that if the solder in the wave process has a different melting temperature or a higher melting temperature than the tin or solder that you're going to use uh, for when you reflow this, it's going to bring that melting temperature hopefully down so that you don't have to put as much energy or as heat onto that joint. And two, when you dilute the chemistry like that, you're also removing that thin layer of oxidation that sits on the, um, the, 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 the tops and surfaces of all these joints on both layers of the board. Now, mixing solder chemistries isn't always the best thing to do. Um, they can actually be pretty disastrous, but for the record, we are fully and thoroughly removing this solder, so it's not a big deal. So let me show you how I do that. 
Okay, I think I've got that zoomed in fairly well. So let's just go ahead. I want to take my knife edged tip. I want to introduce and load up some fresh solder into that tip just like that. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to apply that tip to the top of the joints here. And I'm going to slowly introduce fresh solder. I'm going to go back and forth like this and I'm going to thoroughly heat all of these joints. We're just going back and forth and we're going to make sure we're getting a full wicking effect and letting the solder penetrate deep into the through hole plating. And we're just that's all we're doing. We're just introducing that fresh solder just like that, not leaving a mess behind. Great. Let me just adjust this so you can see the top section. Okay, there's the top. Great. Same principle. We're just going to do that on the other side of the IC. So again, we're going to come right in here and we're just going to bring our knife edge tip down slowly. Slowly and with each little sort of movement that we make, we just introduce a touch more of solder to keep it fresh. We're going up and down, up and down. And we're going to finish that off just like that. Okay guys, that took us 10 seconds and this small little step is probably the most important for when removing the PPU or any dip package, especially something of this size and especially on a main board like this that's thick and has a lot of ground flood that's going to heat soak when you try to put when you try to put heat into these joints. Um, you know, if whether or not you pull traces or you pull through holes, uh, vias, uh, could be based on if whether or not you did this step. So having said that, let's get the tool heated up and let's remove this son of a gun. Okay guys, sorry about the noise, it's just the fan on the desoldering gun here, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to start desoldering all of these joints and we're going to remove this package. So I'm just going to bring my tool into here, into this first joint. I'm going to wait for it to go molten. I'm going to know it's molten because I'm going to give it a little wiggle. See how I can swivel this freely? I'm going to pull the trigger beautifully cleaned on the bottom and top layer. Remember, we're not just doing the bottom layer. There's a top layer to these two. So I'm just going to go down the line. Great. Now, this is all looking really good, but there's one area that I'm not too happy with. And it's this little via right here. It's this little through hole right on the end. As a matter of fact, you can even see that that wasn't cleared thoroughly. This is a big, thick ground flood on the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this down. I want to grab my soldering iron. I'm just going to come in here. I'm going to reapply just a little bit of solder into this joint. There we go. I'm going to come right back in here. Make sure you guys can see this. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to make a little heat bridge here and I'm going to, I'm going to count to maybe four. One, two, three, and four. beautifully cleared. Okay, so now that we've addressed that little pesky ground here in the corner, um, we're going to go and we're just going to inspect. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. When you get all of your desoldering done and you think you've done a pretty thorough job, what you can do is hold this thing up in the air to the light. If you can see light coming through, you're probably well cleared. But what I like to do is, I like to come in here really quick like, and I just grab each of these pins, and I just give them a little shake to maybe break up any residual solder that's in the plate uh, that, that's in the plated through holes or that might be a little burr a solder burr in the top or bottom layer and yep there's one and, and when you do that and, and you find one um, uh, where a pin's still connected and it you'll hear it click when it breaks loose when that little burr may come off 
But at any rate, let's flip this around and let's see if this is ready. Okay, so here's the PPU. Now, here's the trick and here's the secret. You see a lot of people coming in here and they'll take a tool and they'll pry. Well, that's okay to pry a little bit. I mean, if you're putting very little force just to help, you know, there could be pin tension uh, on the pins here uh, as they go into the, into the through holes. There could be any reason. There's several different good reasons why there may be a little resistance. But you never ever want to come in here and you never want to pry this chip out of the board. What I like to do is, I call this the finger test, and this is something I came up with several years ago. If you want to know if this PPU is really ready to come out, take your fingers on the bottom of the board, right here, and just push up, push up on these vias, holding it this way. I'm sorry, on the, uh, on the pads, on the pins of this chip. Now if you do that, and the chip comes, just like it is, see, we can knock this baby around. This sucker's ready to go, so doing that, I just want to take my hand and effortlessly pull this chip out. And that's all, the, that, that's all there is to that. And the reason this was so easy to do and what saved us so much trouble is we prepped these pins by reflowing and introducing fresh solder. So, you know, that's pretty much the gist of desoldering the PPU. And, uh, you know, a couple of very simple techniques there uh, that I hope you guys can use uh, to save you mounds and mounds of trouble. But at any rate, now that we've done that, we're ready to assemble the NES RGB kit and install it. So, let's do it. Now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to install this 40 pin machined socket in place of where the PPU is. Now I know Tim um, supplies two of these uh, with the AV Famicom kit. I use neither of them, but if this is your first installation, you may need to take this board off and troubleshoot. So we've got the kit, uh, we've got the um, socket in the proper orientation, and how do we know that? Let's move the board over here. You'll see this little dip here in the side of the uh, socket. Well, that matches the silk screen on the board. So this is the proper alignment and orientation. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to hold this socket in with our finger and then we're just going to flip the board around just like that. And we're continuing to hold this socket in there. And what I need to do is I need to just get a little bit of solder here. And what I'm going to do is while I'm holding this, very simply, I'm just going to put a little, put a little solder anywhere on the board maybe right there on that joint. You can do it in the corners, whatever's easiest for you. And just make a little joint there. Maybe make a little joint there in the corner, just like that. Now we're gonna come down here. That's holding it This that's holding that in fairly well for us. So now I'm just gonna come down here. I'm gonna put my finger in there, there, nice and tight. And we're just gonna secure this um, socket into position. So now we don't have to hold it anymore. I want to bring the board in just like this. And just like you saw before, we're going to take our knife edged tip here and we're just going to drag solder the socket into place. Now you've seen previous videos where I did an Ultra HDMI install and you saw me using a lot of no clean flux. Well the reason I used so much in that video is just to show you that you don't need to be afraid of it. And it's a lot easier if you're a newbie to just douse everything in flux and then apply your solder. Well, the solder I'm using is pretty good and I really don't need to do that as much. So if you've got good solder and you've got good technique, don't rely so much on it if you don't have to, but it's always there for you. So I'm just gonna come on down just like that in a nice drag soldering pattern. Okay, we're gonna come on the other side. And you'll notice that I'm going really slow here. You, know, you see a lot of people, they'll just come right in here and they'll just, they'll just drag straight down just like that. I don't like that. Why don't I like that? Because this is a thick board, there's two ground planes on both sides, you don't know where that ground flood is, and you want to evenly and thoroughly wet the bottom and top and interplating layers. So I'm just going to come down just like I did before, nice and slow, back and forth a bit, and... That's finished. That is all done. Let's flip this around and let's continue. Now before we move along, we need to remove or lay this cap right here down. Uh, this is the um, AC coupling capacitor for the stock composite video output. And if you're not using the stock composite video output anymore, which I don't think you would be, you can just remove this, or like I said, you can lay it down. 
And just to show you, this adapter will not clear uh, with this cap in the way for the AV Famicom. Now, there's something you need to really pay attention to. This socket, as I said before, is a machine socket. It is designed to interface with these nice, round, circular machine pins. Okay? It's very different than this set of headers here. Now, you're going to get two of them. Don't use these. So we're going to take our machine pin sockets and we're just going to put them in each strip just like so. There we go. And now our adapter board, we're going to bring in, you see where it says motherboard right here? This little annotation? Well that's fairly self-explanatory so we're going to bring that in just like that and put this in position. Now I want to rotate this because we need to solder this into position. So we're going to rotate it, um, let's see, I guess about like that is pretty good. I'm doing that so you guys can see this well. I want to come in here with my knife edge tip just like we did before. Okay, we're going to put our second set of headers into the adapter board. Now we're going to take our NES RGB kit, and by the way, this is the kit, and we're going to mount this in here. Now, I get asked this a lot, and a lot of people mess this up too, what is the proper orientation? Well, we have a bunch of different uh, vias here. Well, the easiest way to remember this is the vias on the edge of the board are the vias that interface with the header of your adapter board. So, we're just going to put those in there like that. And so the outer edge is uh, part of the main board and the inner part right here is a part of the main board uh, adapter. So what I'm going to do is just to hold that in temporarily. Let me hold this with a, with a little bit of uh, pressure here. I'm just going to lock this board in there just like so. That's one. I want to come on the other side here. Actually, I'm just going to come right about here. Good. Now that we've secured the NES RGB kit, we need to trim down the exposed uh, pins on this edge. So I'm just going to take some flush cuts. I'm just going to real quick, like, just come in here. I'm just going to start cutting. Down the line. Great. Okay, now that we've done that, we need to go ahead and we need to install the second 40 pin socket. Now that's going to go right on top. And again, look at your look at your orientation, look at your landmarks on your silk screen. Make sure we have this properly oriented just like that. And we're going to lift this off very carefully and we're just going to turn this around. And let's spot this in real quick so we can uh, make quick, quick work of this. So I'm just going to hold it with my hands just like this. I'm going to push this socket up into the uh, up into the main board so it's nice and nice and flush in there. And I'm just going to just want to take my iron and I'm just going to make a few little little spots here. I want to tack this in in a few different little places. Eh, two, two tack marks should be plenty. So now I'm going to just set this down, like so. And we're going to drag. Great, we got the socket in place. Now we just need to solder and marry the uh, adapter board to the NES RGB kit. So let's do that. All 
Okay, so we have just completed the assembly of the NES RGB kit. Having said that, we can go ahead and put this back in. Okay, just a little more prep work here on the NES RGB mainboard. We're going to remove the RGB AC coupling capacitors. Now, if you recall in my last video where I was actually fixing up a system for somebody, actually I think it was an AV Famicom or a top loader, uh, a couple of videos ago, uh, you'll you'll hear me speak in great detail as to why I remove these capacitors. And the simple explanation is it's simply because these capacitors already exist in the um, in the in the Super Nintendo or Nintendo SCART cable. And when you stack two capacitors uh, like that, like they would be in this configuration, you're actually um, diminishing the total capacitance rating. And so, um, you know, analog video uh, has a pretty darn um, exact sort of specification on uh, what the uh, capacitor value and size should be uh, to mitigate certain voltage errors and um, uh, tilting, line tilting uh, phenomena, and other things that give you kind of a ghosty and bad picture. Now, you know, you may be able to leave these capacitors on there and see virtually no effect whatsoever. And that's really dependent upon how well your monitor or scaler uh, handles uh, that bit of DC drift in the uh, video. Um, you know, it's really up in the air if you'll even notice a difference or not. But you know what I say, better to be safe than sorry. So at any rate, we just removed those three caps and we just simply bridged their connections. Uh, a couple other little quick things here. We will be pulling power from the uh, NES uh, system. Uh, so we're going to be using that 7805 regulator that's on board. I'm going to jump and short J3. And because we have an NTSC system, we'll be using the NTSC color modes. Not that I don't, I won't even be hooking up, um, I won't even be hooking up any composite video or S video on the system, but we'll go ahead and do J5 just for good measure. All right, let me flip this back around. Okay, now we're looking right at the socket here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that PPU. I'm going to sort of gently get it into position just like this. And before I put any pressure down on this thing, I'm going to make sure on both sides that we have perfect alignment and that those pins are going into these very precise machine pin ports, which they all are. So now I'm going to put even pressure on both sides, push the chip in. And there we have it. Great. So let's move on. So at this point, we basically have all of the prep work done on the NES RGB board. It's put together, it's built, um, we've done everything that we need to do, and now we're ready to wire this POS. So what I like to do is I use ribbon cable for everything, and most of you guys know that, and I only need red, green, and blue, and composite sync. Uh, the person who owns this actually likes the AV Famicom's audio circuit, so we won't be using any of the NES RGB's enhanced audio. So I need a four conductor ribbon cable, which is exactly what this is. So what I want to do is I want to take this four conductor ribbon cable, and I'm just going to position it over the soldering fingers here, over the, over the pads, the soldering pads. And I'm just going to kind of gauge distance. Now the multi-out is back here, so I can pretty much determine that, well, that's probably... By the time we add a few little bends, I'll put in an extra two inches. Right here, that's more than enough conductor. I'm going to come right here, and I'm just going to cut that. That's a rough cut of the conductor that we need. And so now, I want to go ahead and I'm going to solder these pads. Like so. I'm going to pre-tin these. There's composite sink. There's red. There's green and there's blue. Okay, let's zoom in and let's talk about wiring. Okay, so we've zoomed in here a little bit and you can see we've pre tinned composite sync, red, green, and blue. I've got my four conductor ribbon cable and I also have this pair of wire strippers that I've had for a long time. Uh, go to eBay, type in automatic wire strippers. I think I got these from China for eight or nine bucks. Um, they've done me very well. But at any rate, we're gonna put our little conductor in there and we're going to strip that insulation away, and it's really that easy. Now, this is going to be probably a little blurry, and it's not going to focus too well. But as you can see, we got a nice pull of that. So now that I've got that wire pre-stripped, 
What I'm going to do, or stripped, not pre-stripped, what an idiot. I want to take my my flux paste, I just want to douse the wire in there just a bit. As you can see, we've got a pretty generous helping there of uh, flux. I'm just going to lay that there, and I hope this stays in focus, because people ask me all the time about stripping and pre-tinning wire. Well, this is just how I do it. So I'm going to hold the flux in, I mean, I'm going to hold the wire in just right here where it is. I want to load up my tip just a little bit. Pre-tin, 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 pre-tin. That's all done. And there you have it. Now we got a little bridge there, but that's okay because I want to cut this to size. And I'm going to do that simply by coming in here with my cutters. And I need just a little bit of material exposed, maybe about right there like that, and cut across like that. Okay, so we've got our four conductor ribbon cables soldered perfectly here to the NES RGB mainboard. Now what we need to do is we need to route this four conductor cable back here to where the multi-out lives. Now this is what I like to do. You can do this any way you want to, but this is just the way I do it. I want to turn it on its side here. Now if you look right under the blue tab here where the cartridge port is, you'll see this little dip, this little blocky square cutout in the flashing. What I like to do is, I like to sneak my cable into that little indentation. And so what I do, if I want to keep the RF shield, which I, I never do, some people may, may want to, if you do that's great, here's what you can do. If you notice on this side, this little flap is still intact, but on the right side, I've cut that little um, metal flap out so that you can absolutely sneak that four conductor ribbon cable down into this little valley and solder it up right here to where the multi-out lives. So now that I've done that and prepped my RF shield, I just want to set this down. I'm going to pick up my NES RGB kit here, uh, an AV Famicom mainboard, and I'm just going to sneak this cable underneath, underneath the NES RGB kit. So there's our four conductor ribbon cable being slid under just like that. Pull it somewhat taut, not too taut, but put some tension on there. Now I, can, I know that this cable is going to effectively round under the cartridge port here, so I want to turn this on its side just to show you how I kind of calculate, calculate, you know, and, and lay out cable for a run like this. So I'm just going to take it, and I am just going to put it in there like so. Great. Perfect. So now I have that cable. It's not being pinched or caught by anything. It's very loose. It's going right into that little, uh, right into that little dip in the plastics. And that's it. Let's take a look at this now. Okay, so now that we've finished up the soldering on the multi outside, let's just put this in there. Let's just put it back into the casing and let's see how good of a job I did. And, yep, absolutely. This cable runs perfectly underneath. Where that little indentation is, it's it's very loose, it's not being pinched or pulled, and it's just the right length. It's no longer than it needs to be, and it's not too short to live in here comfortably. And other than setting, uh, fixing his pallet, I forgot to do that, but I need to uh, hard, uh, hard fix his pallet here to natural, um, this is finished. I mean, this is just uh, a very simple, bare-bones NES RGB install on the AV Famicom. Now I'll show some footage here of this running and, and working well, but uh, ultimately guys, it's not a big deal. Yes, it takes some time. Yes, it takes some, you know, somewhat pricey tools, um, but you know, it's not, it's not a huge deal breaker here in terms of skill set or the equipment that you really need. Uh, like I said earlier, the, the main crux of this is, is that gosh damned uh, PPU extraction. Now unless you have a lot of experience with doing stuff like that, it can be an absolute nightmare and you can ruin your system really fast. So having said that guys, I think I want to call this video done and done. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned something uh, for you guys that are wanting to do some, you know, more difficult mods like this. I hope it really helps. 
Uh, and if it does help, be sure to like and subscribe to me if you haven't already. I really appreciate that. And um, when you do that and you leave me suggestions in the comment section below of videos you'd like to see, I, I really appreciate that because it, it, it kind of gives me the direction uh, that I need to, to know what videos to make. Having said that, appreciate you guys watching. Take care of yourselves, and we'll catch you later. Thank you.